It is also today Donald Trump's 78th birthday. He's already received, though, the gift that he demanded, which has been complete capitulation from the Republican Party. Take a look. Here's the former president making his first appearance on Capitol Hill since January 6th, surrounded by uh, fawning Republican supporters. There's great unity. This is an outstanding group of people. I'm with them a thousand percent. They're with me a thousand percent. We agree just about on everything. And if there isn't, we work it out. And we've had a, I've had a really great relationship with just about everybody here. Perhaps, though, over the years, not with Mitch McConnell, but look at this. The two men hadn't spoken until the Capitol riot, but the Senate minority leader showed up, and there it is. That picture, Doug Mills, the New York Times. Uh, I, I think we should probably clip and save this one, guys, because I think uh, we're going we're gonna to come back to it probably again and again. Uh, it says a lot. Uh, watch this. Did you talk to him directly? Yeah, uh, we uh, shook hands a few times. And he uh, took questions from the uh, audience, and it was an entirely positive session. All right, our panel is here. Former federal prosecutor Elliot Williams, Republican strategist Sarah Longwell, and former White House senior policy advisor Ashley Allison. Welcome to all of you. Uh, clearly, this was designed to show that these guys are all on the same page, all together, that this is Trump's Republican Party now. Um, but Sarah Longwell, this was Liz Cheney, right? So Liz Cheney, who spearheaded the January 6th committee, uh, the investigation into what happened that day, uh, who has been a crusader in the wake of that against Donald Trump getting back into the Oval Office, someone who found in Mitch McConnell something of an ally during this period. They were in many ways on the same page. McConnell, of course, not as vocal, uh, but we know I reported at the time just how close McConnell came to doing something different in the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump because of how much uh, he cared about this. If you know how McConnell speaks about Donald Trump in private, you know the level of disdain that he has for him. And yet, we saw what we saw yesterday. This is what Cheney said yesterday. Mitch McConnell knows Trump provoked the violent attack on our Capitol and then watched television happily as his mob brutally beat police officers and hunted the vice president. He knows Trump refused for hours to tell his mob to leave. And even then, with police officers bleeding, he kept repeating his election lies and praising the criminals. He knows Trump committed a disgraceful dereliction of duty and is a danger to our republic. Trump and his collaborators will be defeated and history will remember the shame of people like Leader McConnell who enabled them. When you see this image of McConnell, it's, yeah, that's, let's keep that up there. What do you see? Uh, I see the ritual humiliation of Republicans who said during January 6th, or right after January 6th, in Mitch McConnell's case, that Trump was morally responsible for the events of the day. He said th th there was no question. And what, what I see, too, uh, in that humiliation is a ton of regret for the decision he made not to impeach Donald Trump. Because if Mitch McConnell had made the decision right after January 6th, to go ahead and rally Republican senators around impeachment, they could have gotten enough to ensure that this moment didn't come to pass. Mitch McConnell is more responsible than anybody else because he was too cowardly to take on Trump after January 6th, despite knowing and saying clearly that Trump was the person who caused the insurrection. He didn't do anything about it, and now he finds him back here having to kiss the ring. And it's like a criminal returning to the scene of a crime and being celebrated by the people he did the crime against. Uh, and, you know, watching Nancy Mace, I mean, I, there was a montage of all of these people and what they said after January 6th. They condemned Trump clearly at the time, and now they're there celebrating him, and it is uh, deeply shameful and embarrassing for them. It's fascinating watching this all play out because it, it makes me wonder what happens after Donald Trump. Right. He will not, whether he's elected president or whatever else, he will not have, he personally cannot have this hold on the party forever. And will someone else, anyone else, engender that kind of, like, I remember what the word you used at the beginning was, but sort of bending the knee to this individual that's often asking them to vote against their interests and take these positions on January 6th and so on. Um, and it's some, I don't know if it's, if it's him, if he taps into something, or if some other standard bearer could, could take over. But, it, but it's wild for all the reasons you've laid out, Sarah, 
uh, that people are still continuing uh, Republicans to line up behind him given all that happened on January 6th. So let's put up on the screen um, another picture, and this is part of why you know I've reacted. Yeah, there you go. Right. So on the left, you have Doug Mills, New York Times photo yesterday, Mitch McConnell shaking hands with Donald Trump. This is the first time the two men have been in the same room spoken since January 6th. On the right, we don't have a date on that photo, but it is just weeks after January 6th. Kevin McCarthy goes down to Mar-a-Lago, meets with Donald Trump, just again weeks after he had gone down, the, down to the floor of the House of Representatives and said uh, that, Kev, that Donald Trump bore responsibility for what happened on January 6th. Now, that McCarthy photo, a lot of people credit with resuscitating Donald Trump at the time. McCarthy kind of trying to read the room. This is something that McCarthy really does in his in the course of his political career. He, he tries to sense where the winds were blowing, and he said he's he decided that this is where he needed to be for his political career down there, and it made a huge difference uh, in terms of Donald Trump then becoming the Republican nominee uh, of the party this time around. And then there you have McConnell on the left. Now today, as we are heading in to uh, the November election, um, Ashley Allison, what do you see here? Big picture, um, and in terms of Trump's electoral prospects in 2024, uh, I mean that—that that was kind of the big picture point of what was ha what happened yesterday, uh, was to try to show Republicans are united. It is definitely easier to win elections united than divided. Perhaps, yes, that's true. I think what's important and a reminder after yesterday's picture, and continues to be a reminder when you think about, I know we'll, talk, we'll probably talk later and show some of the not great things Trump said when he was in the meeting and at his press conference after about certain cities and people. But um, I, I want to step away and just say, like, I'm not going to be, I know that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are running against each other, and when you have opponents, you often compare them. They're not in the same class. Donald Trump is an exception to all politicians. And Elliot, to your question, what does it mean after Donald Trump? It means the people in this moment get to decide if they're gonna follow in line and try and replicate. This is the moment to make a decision, yeah. and these folks are making their point. It's it's hard to swing back the pendulum after these moments when you fall at the you fall and kiss the ring. So I I know people have take issue with Joe Biden. But I am stepping away from that picture in this moment, from stopping to do this comparison of the two. I'm going to start talking about them in very distinct ways, because they are not the lesser, what is not the lesser of two evils? One is someone who forces people to lose what they, their principles, to not even have principles of their own, meaning Donald Trump. And another is, meaning Joe Biden in this instance, is someone who has a party that even in this moment, they have issues where they might not all agree with one another, but they allow for that to happen because that's what happens in democracy. And you can unite and bring people along with you even in moments of disagreement. But right now you don't have disagreement in the Republican Party, you have just people falling in line. Sarah, this was uh, Congresswoman Maria Salazar on Capitol Hill uh, yesterday. I wanna show this just cause you can kind of see in the way she's animated kind of what this, what this portends, watch. He is the leader of the party, and he happens to be the guy who was chosen by the overwhelming majority of Republicans to be the nominee. Who are we to say no? Just like the overwhelming majority of the Dems decided for Biden to be the nominee. That's the reality. Welcome to the United States. Welcome to the United States. Well, she's not wrong <clears throat> about the fact that Republican voters picked Donald Trump. I mean, it is his party. The reason that you see everybody sort of falling all over him is that this is what Republican voters have chosen. I mean, I talk to Republican voters all the time in the focus groups, and there was and is and remains sort of a 30% group of people who really want to move on from Trump. But the other 60% are either hardcore Trumpers or like very fine with Trump. Um, and I think that to Elliot's question about the future of the party and what it means, what's interesting is that when you develop this cult of personality and everybody kind of 
uh, abdicates the things that they believe in service to one person, you don't have a political party, right? You just, you have a cult of personality. And that makes it very difficult when that person leaves to figure out who are we, what do we stand for? Because I don't see a Republican Party that goes back to a place where they're really focused on limited government, free markets, and American leadership in the world. It's not what the party is anymore. That's not what the voters want. And so um, I think that Republicans right now, what you are watching in this moment, is them gambling away a future of being a viable, forward-looking political party and finding themselves sort of collapsed at the time of Donald Trump's ultimate departure, which I hope is in November. To, and and <laughs> that's exactly why I asked the question to raise the point, because in four years, however long it is, whether it's J.D. Vance or Matt Gates or Tim Scott or anybody else, does not have, the, that individual will not, I think, have that kind of charismatic pull on the party. No, and, and thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> thank yeah. you. Like, watching, watching them fall all over him is embarrassing for them. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, I, I, I hope that um, I want the Republican Party to be relegated to a rump party because of sustained electoral defeats that is then incentivized to reform itself into something that is not this dangerous version yeah. of what we're seeing today. You know, 